Before we begin, we'd like to thank the Amgen Ireland team for their generous sponsorship and continued support. Welcome to another episode of Oncology Spotlight. For today's episode, we are exploring the world of hematology. Today, we're honoured to have Dr. Liam Smith from St. Vincent's Hospital, a leading expert in hematology as our guest. Join us as we embark on an enlightening journey through hematology with Dr. Smith. So to kick off, first of all, thanks very much for joining us today, Liam. Uh, no can you give us a brief introduction of yourself and your background? Okay, so uh, I'm Liam Smith. I'm a hematology consultant here at St. Vincent's University Hospital in Dublin. Um, I've been working here for the last uh, five years, uh, still finding myself and finding my way around uh, the world of hematology. Um, but yeah, I've been here for the last five years after my fellowship abroad. Um, I did a fellowship in Ontario, in Toronto, in Sunnybrook, uh, in complex malignant hematology. Um, after I completed my full five years of uh, hematology postgraduate training here in Ireland. Um, oh. So, yep. Great. And what inspired you to uh, pursue a career in medicine? Well, I suppose um, I started off initially as a nurse. Uh, so I did my original nurse training in St. James's Hospital in Dublin and uh, through the diploma course through uh, Trinity College. Um, I think a bit like every Irish nurse you, uh, at the time in particular, you never graduated until you did, did your year in Australia. Uh, so yeah. when I was coming home from Australia, I was kind of deciding what I wanted to do. I was working in the hematology unit in James's um, and I kind of decided I did want to go back to college, wasn't entirely sure what, uh, but wanted to learn a bit more biology and that. So I mm -hmm. think medicine just lent its way in lots of ways. I suppose in part, uh, I kind of applied in some ways of going, well, put that to bed if I don't get it um, and head back to Australia. But uh, I ended up getting it. So I'm here to tell the tale, I suppose. Well, Excellent. Uh, where did you study medicine? So again, in Trinity. So in I, Trinity. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think at the time uh, they were getting ready for the postgraduate courses. Uh, so there was quite a few uh, postgraduate people uh, within our class. So there was a couple of nurses, uh, pharmacists and physios and things. Oh, well, very good. Yeah. And um, what inspired you to pursue a career in hematology? Yeah, so um, throughout my medical training, I continued to work nursing in the bone marrow transplant unit in James's. Um, so again, that was like I found that brilliant because uh, during the time, at least you could continue what uh, you knew to practice on a day to day perspective and you got patient exposure. Um, it wasn't just felt like that you were following uh, teams and uh, around from day to day. So, and plus the consultants that I, I worked with in St. James were very supportive of me doing uh, medicine. Um, so again, when I went through my training initially, I kind of thought I was going to do uh, neurology at one point. Um, but then I just found myself listening out to what was happening to the hematology patients. And, to, and you realize during my SHO training that actually the heme patients, the conditions and the kind of widespread uh, area of hematology, the way it is, because I suppose from different to other specialties uh, were involved in both the diagnosis, treatment planning and long term follow up of patients, uh, yeah. which was something that really interested me. Um, mm. And then again, like there's also benign hematology as well. Uh, so, again, it was quite a widespread discipline. Uh, so it would open itself up to um, many areas uh, to uh, pursue a career in. Uh, so I think in particular, it was the diagnostics. Uh, right the way through to treatments that was really interesting yeah very very good and in in hematology when when a patient is being diagnosed um what's the process or how how, how does how, how does that come about yeah so um for the majority of hematology conditions we get involved our suspected hematology conditions we're involved very early okay. uh, so like patients are referred to us uh, with a suspected cancer or suspected benign hematology condition and mm. um, so again we would see patients we would be involved in that whole workup period uh, which may include for the likes of so I look after a lot of lymphoma patients uh, so helping to uh, organize and arrange uh, lymph node biopsies so excision lymph node biopsies uh, and the scans and then ultimately actually going through the diagnosis with the patient 
and sometimes it includes breaking the bad news of a new cancer diagnosis and trying to walk the patient through well what the next steps will entail I think sometimes, again, because you've been part of that diagnostic workup period, you've had a chance to build a bit of a relationship with the patient and with their families. Um, so I think it's it's good to have, a, I think from their perspective, at least they have a steady person that they've seen uh, the whole way through. Um, mm. And then you're there with them as they're having their treatment and even long-term follow-up. Okay. okay. And coming from it from a you know, you worked both as a nurse and as a physician, and that's 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 very rare, for, in my experience. Anyway, yeah. what are what are the differences? You know, in the, in the day to day work. Yeah, so it's quite interesting. I think also the um the changes actually progress throughout your career as well. So mm. I think um until the patients generally tend to get to know you um as they see the consultant arriving into the room, sometimes the, the barrier is up a little bit and it takes a lot more to break it down. Uh, where in nursing, it was, I found it a lot easier that you could have a more casual conversation with the patient and you found out more information and things like that. They were much more relaxed. So it's trying to mm. set, set that tone uh, sometimes is a different skill set uh, that I found that I've had to develop over time. Um, again, from the nursing perspective, they're around the patients quite a lot, uh, clearly like the majority of, of their shift. So they will see more subtle changes that happen with patients. And sometimes when patients are struggling a little bit more, they might be a bit more open uh, to talking to the nurses initially, uh, who then might relay back uh, some of the issues that the patients might be experiencing or some of their worries or concerns. Um, Again, I suppose from a, a medical perspective, your role is slightly different because you're there to try and design what the best treatment is for that particular patient. Um, you're there to manage the toxicities and side effects that a patient might suffer. Um, but hopefully by trying to bring in the human factor to it as well. So there's crossover, but definite differences. Very interesting. Um, and you know, talking about some of the breakthroughs and the advancements in hematology. Is there anything you've seen in the last couple of years that's excited you? Yeah, so I think particularly in heme in the last couple of years, like it has changed and particularly in lymphoma care has hugely changed. Um, mm. Like it was great to get back to face to face meetings uh, this year and uh, the latter end of last year, and um, like Lugano, which is uh, like the the world uh, lymphoma type meeting, um, it was quite exciting at it because seeing new therapies coming along and seeing how they're evolving. So in particular, when we look at uh, lymphoma. Um, immune-based therapies, I think, are hugely revolutionizing things. Previously, we gave a standard chemotherapy backbone to almost every patient. And now mm. we can see that actually dependent on the type of diagnosis, what we're identifying, well, then actually we're actually more personalizing some of the treatment that we're giving to people. And then also we've seen where uh, some patients actually may no longer respond to treatments that we've given. And in many cases, we would have unfortunately just had best supportive care and palliation and end of life management for these patients. Whereas now we've got the advent of things like CAR T cell therapy or other immune based treatments, including the bispecific T cell engagers. Um, and just seeing how that has revolutionized and will revolutionize how we care for patients in the the very near future uh, is really exciting. Brilliant, brilliant. And anything in, in AI or technology side of things? Well, again, I think uh, probably more in terms of diagnostics will ultimately get there. Um, mm. I think sometimes um, our diagnostics have actually been well ahead of what treatment options have been available. So like our testing could identify uh, some patients with higher risk disease, but yes, we had no treatment paradigm to change um, our management according to it. Um, I think maybe in the future, we're not quite at a, an AI level yet. I think in, in lymphoma care, at least, um, I think in the future might help to personalize the care that we provide to that particular individual patient, uh, particularly as we identify specific markers associated with their lymphoma, for example, uh, that might direct it a little bit more. Very good. Great. 
And how do immunotherapies come into play for lymphoma, lymphoma treatment? I know you were involved in a recent uh, trial in that space. Yeah, so um, during my fellowship in uh, Toronto, we were involved in a vaccine trial uh, mm -hmm. where we combined a vaccine of a, so against a protein that uh, is expressed on lymphoma cells. Um, and the whole idea was that we were trying to adapt the patient's own immune response uh, to the lymphoma cells that was proven previously resistant to normal treatment. Uh, that trial is still ongoing. The outcomes are still ongoing. Um, however, I suppose we've seen it in other areas, uh, particularly with the bispecific T-cell engagers. Um, these are more novel type treatments where uh, it's trying to get your immune system to recognize the lymphoma cell and actually directly attack and kill off the lymphoma cell. And I think that's probably incredibly exciting, like, because before, as I say, we were almost doing a, a domestic or blunderbust approach uh, mm. to try and treat these conditions, whereas now we're actually trying to specifically look and target uh, the abnormal cells. And um, so, again, coming back to our diagnostics, the importance of actually identifying what a lymphoma cell expresses to see then mm. will it respond to some of these new novel treatments. OK, OK. So you're trying to like understand the, 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 the disease first and foremost and then kind of tailor, tailor. it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And again, like in the more trials that have been uh, produced recently, they've just used these uh, bi-specific T-cell engagers or these new novel bite treatments um, mm. on their own. But actually the more mm. recent trials are now combining them with chemotherapy. So again, trying to attack it in multiple ways. Mm. And do you find you, you have all of the cutting edge treatments available like CAR T, et cetera, in Ireland? Um, so it is improving. Um, mm. Unfortunately, um, the... Uh, CAR T cell therapy. So as you know, uh, we have uh, the centre in St. James's Hospital, which provide CAR T cell therapy for the country at the minute. And then also Galway will plan to open a, a new centre. I think the difficulty is um, trying to meet demand. And in particular, mm. as all the clinical trials expand out, uh, if we look at um, uh, clinicaltrials.gov, so the website in the US that uh, legislates or, or lists all the uh, clinical trials that are active, um, the number of trials that are ongoing for CAR T cell therapy and not just in hematology uh, for solid organ tumours or solid tumours as well um, is huge. It's massively increasing. And then even for benign conditions. Uh, so again, at the recent European bone marrow transplant group, they talked about CAR T cell therapy in things like multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, how we're going to manage to meet that capacity demand will be um quite a challenge uh, for all of us to overcome um but also how we're going to meet the financial demand of it as well because unfortunately these therapies as effective as they are um are quite expensive uh particularly the likes of car t where it's individualized to that particular patient yeah and if i understand the process correctly they take blood from the patient and they Maybe maybe better if you explain. No the no no no. Uh, <laughs> As the hematologist. Yeah, no no no. Jeez, you were going fine. Uh, yeah. So exactly, what we do is we take some cells from the patient, or we harvest mm -hmm. them, um, and then they identify. They bring that away to the laboratory, and then add on some engineering to that cell to try and get it to identify. So the T cell then to identify the lymphoma cell, uh, specifically and kill it off. I suppose that's the benefit of the, the bite type treatment is that mm. this would be more an off the shelf type product um, as opposed to being uh, needing to be manufactured for every individual patient. Um, I think what was also interesting about those bite type treatments is that the trials have shown that even people who have failed CAR T cell therapy might mm. respond well to these bite treatments, um, which again, I think is extremely promising that we've got more and more in our uh, armatarium to help us fight uh, these types of uh, lymphomas. Brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's great to see the progress. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you know, hematology, uh, you know, these disorders can be very taxing for patients. How, how do your team approach, you know, beyond the medical treatment, you know, yeah. from an emotional perspective, et cetera? Uh, I suppose exactly as you say, it's a team effort. 
Um, mm. And I think some of the important features are um, like we have our nurse specialists within the areas that provide a huge amount of support uh, for, for the patients on an individual level. Also, we've built up our teams to include things like psych oncology. So again, mm. we encourage nearly every patient uh, to visit the psych oncologist or at least have an introductory uh, chat with them at some point. Um, again, about trying to maintain activity is hugely important. So again, we've got things like our, our own dedicated uh, physiotherapists, occupational therapists and social workers. But also we try to link patients and their families into support groups as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because again, they can provide support that's closer to home, that is mm -hmm. not all centered around the hospital. And I think that's quite important as well. Um, having everything centered within the hospital and where you're receiving your treatment um, just is a little bit more taxing, I think, from patients as well. You're going to a place that um, you know, doesn't carry that same connotations as to, um, oh, I'm here for more chemotherapy or, or I'm here for, it, it actually allows that uh, diversion and um, another means just really to support people through their treatments. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And, and it's, it's, it obviously sounds like a big team effort. So are you yeah. collaborating with other specialists as well, like oncologists? Yeah. Yeah, so we work very closely together. Um, mm. I suppose, again, uh, from a lymphoma perspective, previously in Ireland, um, lymphoma was managed by uh, oncologists. And mm. over the last number of years, it's transitioned to hematology uh, and is seen much more as a blood-related cancer. However, we have lots of links with our oncology colleagues. Um, we share some multidisciplinary team meetings. They would have people like endocrinologists present, particularly to help try and manage um, things like early menopause, osteoporosis and that in uh, patients post-cancer treatment. There may be cardiologists attached to man manage some of the long-term cardi uh, cardiovascular side effects of treatment or uh, respiratory physicians, again, managing long-term uh, respiratory issues post-cancer treatment. So we're getting there, but we've a lot more further to go in terms of the survivorship uh, after cancer. Of course, of course. And um, how, how do you stay up to date You know, with all of the new data coming out etc yeah, it's a big yeah. challenge yeah it's particularly challenging i think um because of course there are so many publications every day and actually trying to decipher through well, what is a meaningful publication and, and what uh, is truly practice changing and um, i always find actually uh, conferences are extremely useful for that um, mm. and because often after something has been presented at a conference the paper will appear quite quickly after it and um, mm. so I think it's always useful you get plus you get the more personal approach to it in terms of somebody presenting their data as opposed to being just on a piece of paper uh, reading it out um, the other thing really is then as part of our MDTs and um, mm. so again if a colleague has seen a paper read it um, again, we'll discuss it as to whether it's appropriate to use in that particular patient presentation. And then even within our own teaching schedule for our uh, junior teams uh, within the hospital. So again, trying to uh, discuss up-to-date papers, discuss even how to critique those publications that are made. Uh, so they would be the main ways that we would do. And then, of course, uh, we get lots, particularly with the virtual world nowadays, uh, mm. there's lots of access uh, to online um, lectures, talks and seminars. So um, I still think there's not mm, that can beat the face to face side yeah. of it. Um, but yeah. yeah. And do you, do you attend Eha and Ash? Yeah, so um, as a this year, I attended um, the European Bone Marrow Transplant Meeting because we have a an autologous transplant center here at St. Vincent's and I was at uh, the Lugano meeting. Um, I'll be going to uh, a CLL meeting uh, later in the year. Um, mm -hmm. Ash, I'll have to miss out this year because clearly you have to do some work as well. So, uh, but I'll plan for Ash probably the year after next again. Okay, yeah. Do you find that the the kind of smaller, more niche meetings better than the or you know more more useful? Yeah, I, I think the benefit of a larger meeting is that there might be some areas that um you want to keep a little bit up to date on, but you don't need mm -hmm. to go into the minutiae of it. So mm -hmm. particularly at the larger meetings, I think that's very useful. Um whereas you like depending on the area that you subspecialize in, 
um, you really do have to go to those sub-specialization meetings uh, to try mm. and completely make sure that you're staying on top. Um, okay, excellent. Um, are there any misconceptions about hematological disorders um, that you'd like to clarify? Yeah, well, I think some of the things are when people are attending hematology clinics, doesn't always mean cancer. Okay. I think the poor patient sometimes waiting in the waiting area because they might be sharing that with patients with cancer diagnosis. It doesn't always mean that you're attending for a potential cancer diagnosis. Um, often we see lots and lots of benign related disorders that come to see us. Um, other things are, um, I think people hear the word leukemia and of course that frightens the life out of everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but trying to remember that actually there are many, many different types of leukemia, including chronic leukemias that actually we can watch for many, many years and may never, ever require treatment. And the same is said for some uh, what we call the lower grade lymphomas. There may be some that we can watch for many, many years. Um, I think on the flip side, um, I think it's important too that from patients, I've seen patients who have been diagnosed with a, a new diagnosis of lymphoma. And I think sometimes people try and comfort them and say, well, oh, at least it's lymphoma and it's not such and such a cancer. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes you're starting off the back foot then if you're meeting the patient, trying to set out, well, what their particular prognosis from that cancer is. Um, so again, I think trying to get the balance right between offering comfort, but offering um, true um, information to the patient about their prognosis, I think is really important. Okay, great. And um, do you have any, you know, rewarding moment or patient success yeah. story that kind of reaffirmed your dedication to hematology recently? Yeah, so um, I suppose like even hearing about some of our patients, so like today in my clinic, I had a patient who's returned from uh, three months in Canada and is now moving to the UK after finishing her lymphoma treatment two years ago. Um, mm -hmm. So even hearing about people getting on with their uh, normal living, that alone is hugely rewarding. Or getting cards from patients uh, who have attended children's weddings and things like that is great. Um, or even on the flip side, where unfortunately somebody has had multiple lines of treatment and unfortunately things haven't gone the way you wanted it um, or clearly the, the way the patient has wanted. Uh, but again, having uh, heard about, like for example, I've had a young patient who um, unfortunately did not do well from his lymphoblastic lymphoma, so a very aggressive lymphoma, um, but spending time with his siblings and his friends, having pizza and whatnot in the room, things like that can be rewarding that they're it's a different way, uh, but to the fact that they got time to to do that and make those memories. But I think one case in particular that sticks out is a gentleman that I actually saw in clinic just yesterday. And um, he was referred to me uh, two years ago, um, having had some treatment in a different institute uh, for a lymphoma diagnosis. And he'd become progressively more unwell over the previous two months. Um, and I saw him as a consult. Unfortunately, when I saw him, he was uh, seriously unwell and actually he was uh, moved to the intensive care unit um, where he developed a, a, an exaggerated inflammatory condition called HLH, where basically he had very high fevers. He had bone marrow suppression, so not making the normal white cells, red cells and platelets and um, a very exaggerated inflammatory response. He ended up in the ICU unit for approximately three months. And on many of the days, unfortunately, I had chats with his wife to say that I wasn't sure he was going to survive. Um, thankfully, he did uh, with some chemotherapy and moved out uh, to our ward, uh, but had, was very significantly debilitated by the length of time that he had to uh, be in the intensive care unit for and the medicines that were required uh, to treat him. Um, and then, unfortunately, given his diagnosis and his young age, he was only 38 at the time, uh, we weren't able to get an appropriate rehabilitation center for him. So he ended up having his rehabilitation center in our hospital uh, on our inpatient unit. 
And after about eight months in hospital, he eventually was able to walk out of hospital. Um, now, clearly, that was due to many, many people, in particular our physio, OTs, social work, um, our clinical psychologists um, and the nursing staff really motivating him to get him moving. Um, we were always suspicious that um, he had a significant lymphoma in the background that we just weren't able to get the true diagnosis for. And we had planned to repeat scans on him uh, a couple of months after his discharge. Uh, but actually, just prior to those scans, he represented where he had hemoptysis or was coughing up some blood. And then we repeated a scan and we identified a lymph node mass. So he had a biopsy done, which confirmed the diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma, um, which was clearly devastating to identify the lymphoma. But at least we had something that we felt that we could treat. Mm. And during the course of his treatment, um, he tolerated that reasonably well, uh, but we'd planned to do a stem cell transplant on him. Um, so we gave high dose chemotherapy plus a stem cell rescue to try and eradicate his lymphoma forever. Uh, he, he was very high risk during that transplant and actually spent quite a, a significant amount of time in ICU again. Um, and during the course of that, um, he recovered and his blood counts recovered. And uh, yesterday I, I saw him. He's doing well. Um, he still has a bit of weight to gain and things like that. Um, but uh, he's now tomorrow going to celebrate his 40th birthday. So um, I think seeing him up and about and doing quite well. He has a young family um, and actually doing normal living over the summer. Um, I think that in particular is probably one of the most uh, challenging, but also rewarding cases that we've looked after. Brilliant. That's, that's, that's a great story and uh, yeah, very inspiring. Yeah. Um, and then very final question. Um, is there any advice you would have for any patients or caregivers listening to this? Um, I think it's almost twofold. I think from a patient perspective, um, I think, Patients certainly want to be involved along their journey. And I think in particular, um, I think once patients get into the role of having their treatments, they get into the days of recovery and then coming back for the next round of treatments. Often during that time, actually, I find that patients cope quite well, actually. It's the highest stress load for the family because they're always worried about the risk of infection and things like that. Mm -hmm. And often patients only start to um, adapt to their cancer diagnosis when the treatment has finished, because it's then that they have the most amount of time to actually think about what they've been through. And I think it's really important that patients talk to us. They ask mm -hmm. and reach out for some of the services. We offer services, um, but also that we look to try and build up that survivorship in that period after. And in particular here in our hospital, uh, we have a Thrive and Survive program for patients who have undergone cancer therapy. And it's all about readaption back into the real world, how people recover after uh, lymphoma treatment or cancer treatment. I think the other part is about regular exercise. Uh, mm. Some people hate when I, I tell them this. Uh, I don't point myself as a a person who's good at doing regular exercise, but in particular, what we know is that exercise itself is good to maintain fitness and reduce side effects of treatment. It doesn't have to be running on a treadmill. It could be just a 10 minute walk every day. But also we know that there is some evidence to support that actually regular exercise after lymphoma treatment reduces the risk of recurrence. So actually maintaining that regular exercise actually is really important. And God forbid, should the lymphoma recur, well, then at least the patient is in their fittest state in order to receive further treatment. And then I think from a caregiver perspective, I think it's just about how to provide those supports. Again, the caregivers or, or family members know the patient better than anyone. So it's kind of knowing when to offer the support and when to take a step back, I think is really important. Um, and similarly for people outside of the family, even just doing practical things like providing a meal, uh, helping with washing, doing even a, a, bringing the patient to the hospital for the day of treatment that might take the pressure off some other family members. Um, I think it's just trying to be practical without being uh, maybe overbearing at times um, from a day to day perspective. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Liam. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Not at all.